wanted to check her adventurous and lawless proceeding were distanced in a twinkling. At almost 40 miles an hour, Parsons Turbinia was not just the fastest ship on Earth, she was just about the fastest thing on Earth. The Navy did not catch her. The reporter continued. Her speed was astonishing, but accompanied by a rushing sound and a stream of flame as long as the funnel itself. Unless these serious defects can be corrected, the system of propulsion devised by Mr. Parsons cannot be applied to torpedo boats for whose operations silence, secrecy, and invisibility are indispensable. How wrong could one man be? The turbine changed the naval fleets of the world overnight. It would revolutionize torpedo boats, cruisers, destroyers, aircraft carriers, everything. USS Bunker Hill is a Ticonderoga-class cruiser with the United States Pacific Fleet. The engines are uh, LM2500 gas turbine engines. Uh, it's a 16-stage uh, compressor turns at about uh, 10,000 RPM, propels the ship through the water uh, at speeds in excess of 30 knots. The turbine really hasn't changed in principle over the last century. Uh, there's been some mechanical changes that make it uh, more maintenance free, uh, but the general principle is the same. The turbine didn't only have the effect of driving the ship much faster through the water, it also allowed the ship to be made to a much more compact design because the old piston engine had, of course, to have considerable clearance over the crank shaft for the pistons to go up and down. And the more powerful an engine you wanted, the greater the height of the rise and fall of the piston had to be. So battleships stood high out of the water if they had piston engines and were therefore easier to hit. By introducing the turbine, you got the profile of the ship much lower. It made it a more difficult target for the enemy and it also allowed you to distribute armour much more efficiently. And of course the saving in the weight of armour contributed to increasing the power of the ship. So it was altogether a much, much more efficient design. The turbine found no greater champion in the British Navy than Admiral Sir John Fisher, commander of the Mediterranean fleet and known to his officers and men alike as Jackie. Well, Jackie Fisher was a most unusual naval officer. He looked oriental. He had a sort of rather feline, feminine face. He also had a sort of a, a mind of oriental subtlety, there's no doubt about that, allied to a very fierce will. A charismatic leader, he loved to dance, and he loved his officers and men to dance. In popularity and style, Fisher was compared to his hero, the legendary Admiral Nelson. This was a fitting comparison because Fisher was about to inherit a navy that needed another great leader like Nelson. He had an extremely intelligent and creative mind, and he saw that the Royal Navy was in urgent need of modernization, not just technically, um, but uh, culturally as well. Fisher said it was ridiculous that in a navy which had said goodbye to sail 50 years before, uh, and which was entirely dependent for its future on command of technology, that the engineers should be treated as an inferior class. So he introduced common education, so that at the initial point, engineers and seamen should be trained together. It didn't altogether work, but at least it was a beginning. In the 1890s, the fleet was a ragtag collection of warships pieced together from a period of experimentation that would become known as the Age of Uncertainty. But advances had been made with the guns. As the armor got progressively thicker, 
newly developed slow-burning gunpowder in combination with a much longer barrel had increased the gun's range and power of penetration enormously. The breech loader had come of age. But in 1896, the British Navy was a Navy grown complacent from years without combat. Fisher had the guns. What he needed next was the gunners. DOI, Swick and the OD will also verify range clear or foul. Clear MSS Bird's Way, 8315. And the tick Swick, uh, we don't have a visual on this uh, track 8012. Firing accuracy or fire control on Bunker Hill is not something a sailor from Fisher's Navy could begin to comprehend, even as science fiction. Right now, sir, I'm standing quick. Highlighter Alpha, this is vertical source and track bearing. 178, 28 nautical miles, course 343, over. PSCI, step 14 is complete. Test is off. 15 complete. Magazine is deauthorized. And the test is red. Uh, we're getting ready to do a missile firing exercise. We'll have a uh, target drone fly out past us, and we're going to shoot at it our missile system. Aft SMs are depermitted. It's a supersonic target. It's going to come by us a uh, couple of miles out. So it's going nearly as fast as the missile we're shooting at it. So you got to be on your toes and do everything just right, or it's it's gone in by before you know. But that's exactly the training that we need. Drones away. Not Alpha, but this is vertical sword. Birds away, track 8304. A direct hit. In 1899, Fisher's search for a top gun had produced a star, Captain Percy Scott. In shooting competitions introduced by Fisher, one crew consistently outgunned the rest. They were the men of the HMS Scylla, Scott's men, and they caused a sensation. Soon other gun crews in the fleet, inspired by their new hero, embarked on what would be remembered as a gunnery revolution. Scott's gunnery revolution is not a single change. It's a continuous revolution, beginning with systems that allowed men to load and fire the guns more rapidly, then systems that allowed the sights to be kept on the target continuously, despite the rolling of the ship. The other thing Scott brought in was director firing. If you can actually operate all the guns from a single spot in the ship, a director at the top of the foremast, you can actually improve your capability to fire your big guns at once and accurately at long range. Scott's gunnery systems, even the early ones, improved the rate of hitting at standard combat ranges from 25% to 90%. Uh, were considered absolutely revolutionary and were copied all around the world with great success by the Japanese, the Americans. This was the, the ancestry of modern naval artillery. The ability to use big guns accurately over huge distances was having an effect on global thinking about what sort of guns a new generation of warship might have. Early steel battleships were what were called mixed caliber ships. That is, they had a usually a relatively small battery of the heaviest caliber guns, say perhaps 12 or 13 inch, and a, an extensive battery of medium caliber or cruiser weight guns that were part of the ship's offensive armament. As fire control improved and as battle ranges opened up, this put an end to the usefulness of the intermediate battery. If we discard the cruiser weight battery and put all our eggs into the, into the major caliber basket, this will have a number of different uh, advantages. One, of course, it simplifies logistics. You only need one caliber of offensive armament, so there's only one caliber of ammunition required. It makes salvo spotting uh, much more practical. It rapidly became accepted throughout all the navies that the big guns fired together in salvo would be the best way to arm the new battleships. 